Russia had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have 2,300 tons. China had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have about 2,000 tons, just slightly less, that we know of. And they may have several thousand tons off the books in the State Administration of Foreign Exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more. When you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like dollars per se. What I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they use the Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but, uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets and so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the ruble aren't going to replace anything. I'd like to begin, uh, with your recent thoughts on Russia and then, Part two for the folks at home, we will, we will be uh, tackling the issue of inflation. Uh, but I'd like to start uh, by getting your thoughts, obviously, on Russia and Ukraine. And uh, something that you recently wrote, that what happens in Russia doesn't stay in Russia. Russia may be the first victim of U.S. sanctions, but the entire world will pay the final price. Well, the repercussions may be felt for 10 years or longer, uh, but the the, uh, the immediate impact is going to go well beyond, um, uh, you know, the so-called sanctions. What the point I was really making was we're slapping sanctions on Russia. Russia is hitting back with some retaliatory actions, uh, and it's pretty easy to, to look at the direct impact of that, but there's second order and third order effects that will pop up all over the world and could very quickly get out of control. And think of it as the economic equivalent of a nuclear war. Nobody wants a nuclear war. Uh, but the, they, the, the one thing they all said in common, the one thing they all shared was, don't go there. And what they meant was that nobody wakes up and says, oh, gee, I think I'll start a nuclear war today. What a good idea. That, that never happens. What does happen is you get into an escalatory situation, back and forth and back and forth, where you're escalating and escalating, and you end up in a nuclear war. You never intended it, never started out that way, but you end up there through escalation. Now take that, and that, that, that is good analysis, take that and apply it to what is now, I would say, the first full-scale economic war, uh, sanctions war. We've had sanctions, you know, for a long time. I mean, going back to the, at least the seventies with, with Iran, but even before that, I mean, FDR put sanctions on Japan. Nothing on this scale. This is, uh, unprecedented in its scope and application. Uh, and my only point is it, it, the effects of this are going to not just last a long time. Yes. But they're going to pop up in very, very unexpected places. Um, you know, the beauty of, of Twitter is that you can uh, you can you can look back in history. And there's a tweet of yours uh, that came up from 2015, Jim, because you're talking about how these things don't brew overnight. And back in 2015, this is the soothsayer that you are. You had written or tweeted, Russia is arming uh, Ukraine rebels and U.S. is preparing to arm Kiev. So we'll have a nice little U.S.-Russia proxy war soon, just like hashtag Vietnam. Did you expect anything like this? Um, I, I did. It, it, uh, let me make the, let me make the point. This was uh, there was never a war that was easier to prevent. There's there's never been a war that's easier to prevent, and there's never been a war that's easier to end. The, the, you could end this war in 48 hours or less. Uh, having said that, I did expect that through a series of policy blunders and escalation, in this case, military escalation and political escalation. And then later in the book, around on page 250 or so, I have a whole section on Ukraine, Russia, and natural gas. So this has been brewing for a long time. Um, you can go back to the 2008 Bucharest Declaration, but if you, if you want to pick one thing and say, hey, when, when did this thing take a turn for the worse right. so that we were on a path to war? That was the color revolution sponsored by Obama and Biden, um, which was a coup d'etat. I mean, the, the president of Ukraine at the time, he was pro-Russian, and Obama set out to depose him, and they did. And they put in Poroshenko, who was a U.S. puppet. And at the same time, like a month, 
uh, well, two months after the color revolution, one month before Poroshenko, uh, Putin took Crimea. He said, okay, that's how you want to play. Fine. Uh, you throw out, you move away from neutrality, move towards NATO, NATO. I'll take Crimea, your move. And then there was nothing. To, Putin didn't take one square inch during the Trump administration because Trump is, Trump is highly unpredictable, but put Biden back in, who was part of the original Obama Biden team. And so not only was Trump not in Putin's pocket, uh, he was the only one who stood up to Putin in such a way that Putin didn't take one square inch of territory. He took Crimea under Obama. Now he's taking kind of half the country under Biden. Didn't take anything under Trump. So that completely debunks that. But just to take it one step further, who is in the pocket of, um, of, the, of the Ukrainians, at least? And the answer is Joe Biden, because of Hunter Biden, who made millions of dollars from Burisma, their large natural gas company. Ukraine is ranked... Uh, in the low 90s of the of the most corrupt countries in the world in other words the it's at the bottom on a corruption list with the best with the, with the most honest countries being on top um ukraine is very close to the bottom it's it's the most corrupt country in europe one of the most corrupt countries in the world Zelensky is just another oligarch just another phony uh, now you can take size but to me putin's a dictator Zelensky's a dictator you know pick your dictator but um, this idea that he's some you know, good guy Democrat is nonsense. I want to get back to your point when you said this war could be over in 48 hours. How would that play out for you? Well, it's a phone call, basically. I mean, Biden uh, Biden's kind of non-compass mentis, but somebody with a, who can you know, string a few sentences together needs to call Zelensky and say, um, here's what we're going to do. You, you're not going to join NATO. Well, we'll get the, the NATO Secretary General, John, John Stoltenberg, uh, to say that. You need to say it, and the U.S. will say it. So you're not going to join NATO. You're not going to join the EU. You can be independent in the sense of being autonomous, but you have to be neutral. When, when you've got two great powers, whether it's the U.S. and Russia or um, the U.S. plus Europe and Russia confronting each other, uh, the idea of buffer states, I mean, that's as old as, uh, you know, uh, if not history, uh, at least the, the history of buffer states is uh, several centuries old at this point. It's, it's a part of what every international uh, strategist uh, looks at. So Ukraine should be a buffer state. It should be neutral. Uh, that way, Putin has no reason to invade, and we have no reason to try to push the borders of NATO to a point slightly east of Moscow, which uh, Moscow hasn't been attacked from the east since Genghis Khan. Let's talk about uh, the economic war once the kinetic war, as you say, is over. And, uh, you know, you say Russia is not a punching bag that takes hits without hitting back. You cite, for example, Russia will be teaming up with China to ro roll out the Chinese credit card system for Russian consumers. This comes after Visa and MasterCard ended all business with Russia. Their efforts won't end there. So let's start with that. This how we might see this power play emerge between China and Russia, or this teaming up, this partnership. These sanctions will not work to stop the war or slow the war or change the outcome of the war. Now, they absolutely punish the Russian economy. Yep. They punish Russian individuals, consumers, Russian citizens, they're going to have fewer options, uh, more expensive goods, um, you know, their economy is going to slow down, unemployment will go up, the ruble is devalued. All those things are true, but they're also true in the United States. We're going to punish Americans far worse than the Russians. Uh, we're already seeing, I took a long trip yesterday, uh, I filled up my car with gas at the end of the trip.